Welcome to the Explorers. Time traveling through history, one era at a time. I'm Kate Armstrong. Last time, we found out just how much work we ladies are doing in Tudor England. Now, well, we're going to work some more. Grab your linen basket and a sturdy accounts ledger. Let's go traveling. <laughs> Now that we've gotten our house clean and our bread and butter and ale in order, we will turn our attention to the never-ending laundry. This is exclusively a woman's job, and as we discussed when we attended to our personal hygiene, it's vital to our overall health. We tutors feel really strongly about our laundry. It's our best defense against uncleanliness, and therefore the evil miasmas floating around on the air. Unclean linen invites illness, and so we will wash it constantly, and we'll be doing it all by hand in a process known as bucking. But we won't be using soap or hot water. What? If Tudor times are going to teach us anything, it's that soap isn't the only effective means of getting clean. Here's our time-traveling companion, Ruth Goodman. Soap was uh, usually used only on things like uh, collars. If you had like a posh ruff or, you know, the caps around your face, that sort of thing, you might use soap on those more delicate fabrics. If you've got a really, really fine weight um, linen that was, you know, delicate or, or lace or something like that, you wouldn't want to use the ordinary laundry methods that would destroy it. You need this more gentle laundry method and that would be, mean soap. Every other bit of linen, anything that was tough enough to take it, which was pretty much everything else, your shirts, your smocks, your sheets, your, <laughs> your towels, everything like that, was washed with lye, not soap. Lye is an alkali, hence the name, that we can get by pouring cold water through some wood ash. Wood ash is cheap and plentiful. Just go on over to your cold fire pit and grab yourself a pail. But we don't want to tumble pure wood ash with our best linen napkins, so we'll create a kind of filter out of straw. Put the wood ash on top and pour some water through it. What we end up with will be a very strong solution that's going to do a bang up job of cleaning our clothes. The simplest thing to do was to take your laundry and put it into some basket, bucket, it didn't matter what. Baskets were quite common. Set it up on a couple of bricks. Throw all your most dirty, greasy things in it. Um, and then you just take a jug of this liquid that you strain through the water, the, 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 the wood ash, and just pour it on top and let it just drip through slowly. And it will dissolve all the grease as it goes. Because the alkali is quite a strong chemical, it also kills bacteria, so you're going to end up with a very hygienically clean wash. Um, and you've at no point have you ever had to heat any water. The next step is going to take some brute strength and is a great way to get out any pent-up frustration. The labor-intensive piece is this last stage, which you probably save up until you had a nice fine day, because you're going to be doing this outdoors with cold water. You don't want to be doing it, you know, when the weather's terrible. You take your, your washing to a water source, where you might have one in your yard, or you might have to go to the local stream. And then when you get there, if you take a little stool with you and set some water, so that even if you have to sort of stand on the stones, I mean, you've got a stool to put the clothes on, you dunk them in the water, put them on the stool, hit them with a big stick. The hitting with a big stick drives the water under pressure through the fibres, and that, of course, forces dirt away back in the river, like a dunk of water, back on the stool, bang, 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 bang. Bash that linen. It's a spin cycle, but fueled by you. Then we'll leave our clothes out in the sun. Linen gets its signature whiteness with regular washing and sun bleaching, and crisp whites are a sign of wealth and cleanliness. If you're a washerwoman, it's in your best interest to advertise just how very white you get your whites. Most gentry and aristocracy pay a woman to do their laundry for them, and it's often a highly respected position. Working positions at the Tudor court are quite limited for women, but at Henry VIII's court, the laundress is the only permanent female staff, and she's important. Not just anyone is allowed to touch his highnesses under things. She's recorded as making 10 pounds a year for her trouble. 10 pounds! She's even given some gardens at Westminster. 
She's earned it, I reckon. One of the methods for cleaning an extravagantly embroidered shirt without ruining its stitch work involves soaking its ruffs and cuffs in urine. Fun, fun. The royal laundress has a role that's both important and sensitive, especially when it comes to doing laundry for queens. Case in points. Before Catherine of Aragon could marry Henry VIII, she was put through a sort of inquisition to find out whether her marriage to Henry's elder brother, Arthur, was ever consummated. During the ordeal, her laundress was actually brought in to testify, presumably because she'd have handled any bloody sheets or underthings. Elizabeth I will have just two laundry women over the course of her entire reign, and they will travel with her everywhere. It's kind of a special and sacred privilege to get to deal with the queen's menstrual rags. We ladies will have other household duties, too. We'll keep busy feeding livestock, gathering eggs, and tending to our gardens. That garden isn't just about making the house look pretty, either. We'll be growing plants and herbs here that are central to our cleaning, cooking, and our family's health. We will be distilling, preserving, and drying herbs to use for medicine, because we ladies are our household's primary care physician. Our life expectancy in Tudor times might shock you. The average lifespan in the early 16th century is barely 30 years old. That number is heavily skewed by our infant mortality rate. Some 25% of children die before their first birthday, and 50% before they turn 10. So death is an ever-present specter, and our family's healthcare is quite vital. But some of our ideas about how our bodies work are not what the modern woman might desire. We Tudors believe in a notion that stretches back to ancient times, that everything on Earth, including our bodies, is governed by four elements – fire, earth, air, and water. Each of these has a character of its own. The same can be said about the four humors that make up our bodies – blood, red color, black color, and phlegm. The exact balance of each varies from person to person, but some differences boil down to our sex. Men have more of the blood humor, so they tend to run hot and dry. This, of course, makes them vigorous and virile. We ladies, by contrast, have more phlegm, so we are naturally cold and damp, and thus are weaker, both mentally and physically. I don't make the rules, okay? That's just science. True healthfulness is all about keeping these various fluids in balance. So anytime one of our humors gets out of whack, we're bound to get sick, and we're unlikely to have a trained doctor nearby to tend to us. Which is maybe okay, because most doctor training at this time is very, shall we say, academic. Most doctors aren't doing any practical learning or dissection. Most believe that just by looking at a patient's urine, they can read the balance of our humors, almost like they're reading smelly tea leaves, and advise the apothecary about what they should prescribe. They're expensive as well, so most of us are just going straight to our apothecary, or the local barber surgeon, who will do everything from cutting your hair to pulling out a tooth to performing a spot of surgery. No thank you. Many towns don't have any of these options readily available, and there are few hospitals. No wonder, then, that most of us just tend to our own. That's not to say that women are allowed to train as doctors in this era, because of course they're not. Our old friend Gervais Markham makes sure to say in his manual for housewives, We must confess that the depth and secret of this most excellent art of physic is far beyond the capacity of the most skillful women. And yet he goes on to list all sorts of recipes for at-home doctoring. It's clear that women at home are doing a lot of tending to the sick. We have a letter from one nobleman, John Paston, to his wife Marjorie, asking for her to send one of her trusty poultices for his ailing friend. When you send me the poultice, you must send me writing of how it should be laid and taken from his knee, he implored her, and how long it should abide on his knee without removal. Another woman in the family wrote her husband, showing a clear distrust of trained doctors. For God's sake, be wary what medicines ye take of physicians of London. I shall never trust to them. 
Most of our medicinal recipes will have been passed down to us through female family members. Some we might get from books of the age. We'll be treating all of our family's minor ailments. Sores might be soothed away by poultices of elder leaves soaked in milk, while fevers might be treated with spoonfuls of rose water, aquavit, vinegar, and a couple of special ingredients called dragon water and mithridate. That should be an adventure. Interestingly, though, there are some female surgeons operating in city hospitals. In 1576, one Mrs. Cook will be employed at a London hospital for orphans as the resident surgeon apothecary. Another woman named Mother Edwin will be brought in to treat a boy's hernia in 1563. She charges for her services, the materials required, and she even lays down an additional fee for once the boy is cured. There are also a good number of ladies who practice without any official qualification. Some aristocratic gals even learn some doctoring as part of their official education and practice it to aid the poorer people in her neighborhood. Of course, a lot of the working male medical practitioners are not fond of this situation. The head of the Barber Surgeons of London will complain loudly about them in 1562, saying that patients suffer for being treated by witches, by women, by counterfeit rascals that took upon them to use the art of surgery. It's words like these that remind us to be careful about how we go about our doctoring. An act from 1512 states that nobody should practice physic or surgery except men who have graduated from Oxford or Cambridge. The act explicitly says it is aimed at common artificers as smiths, weavers, and women that boldly and customarily take upon them great cures and things of great difficulty, in which they partly use sorcery and witchcraft. Which is a label we ladies will want to avoid at all costs. So long as we stick to tending to our loved ones and don't try to doctor professionally, the powers that be will probably leave us alone. Are you tired yet? Too bad, because there's bound to be a lot more to do. We might also have to make time for spinning, winnowing wheat, making hay, going to market, or making the kids new pairs of linen undies. If it's harvest time, we'll likely be helping out in the fields, too, driving the plow, shearing corn, and filling muck wagons. Even wealthier women will work beside their staff to manage their households, but at least we're admired for our ability to do these things well. The ideal Tudor woman is extremely competent. The ideal Tudor woman to the Tudor mind is somebody who can do all the things that need doing. She is a good dairy woman, a good brewer, a good baker. She has marvellously healthy chickens. Her garden looks fantastic. Her kids are all well looked after and grown and well clothed. She's managing the entire thing. If her husband buggers off for a, a, whatever reason, she takes over the farm and manages that as well. Or she manages his business when he's away. If she gets widowed, she just takes it all. She does his as well as hers. She is the most proactive, competent, capable person. <laughs> Now that's an ideal I could uh, enjoy. <laughs> the downside, of course, is that we're unlikely to have the time or luxury to kick up our feet and read a good book. How likely are we to be able to read one anyway? We girls can expect to get at least some education. Most in this century go to school for at least a handful of years. But we won't be taught as much, or even the same things, as boys. After all, says educationalist Richard Mulcaster, Naturally, the male is more worthy. A decent number of us should be able to read, but estimates based on legal documents, people who could sign their name instead of just making their mark, suggest that in 1500, around 5% of men and just 1% of women could write. By the time Elizabeth I takes the throne, that will have grown to 20% of men and 5% of women. All Tudor youths, boy and girl, are taught dedication to God and obedience to their elders and superiors. We'll talk more about education in a future episode. For now, just know the main goal of a girl's education is not about teaching her independent thinking, but about how to be a good, godly, helpful wife. Because for most of us, marriage will be the clearest path to financial security. But that doesn't mean we won't be working for a crust ourselves. <laughs> Next.
next time, we'll meet some boss women of business and explore being a lady under Tudor law, how a woman might bend the rules to her advantage, and also what could happen if she breaks them. See you then. Thanks for listening. If you like the show, tell a friend or leave it a review. It really helps new listeners find it. I'd like to thank some of my patrons, whose generous support really keeps the show alive. My adventuresses Alexis, Anna, Carlos, Helena, Iris, Jessica, Amber, Kelly, Lizzie, Phil, Samantha, and Stephanie. My boss ladies, Amy, Annabelle, Bethany, Bronwyn, Elizabeth, Grace, Jessica, Sophie, and Julian, Melissa, Michelle, Monique, Nuria, Rebecca, Sarah, and Tanya. My warrior queens, Lori and Avery. My imperial empress, Faye and Whimsy Soapworks. And my lady pharaohs, the three wonderful Courtney's and Mary Kay. Patrons get early access to episodes, as well as exclusive bonus episodes you won't find anywhere else, full interviews, contests, and more. To find out all about it, just go to my website, theexplorerspodcast.com, where you'll also find this episode's show notes. Much thanks to Ruth Goodman for time traveling with us. You can find a link to her work in this episode's show notes as well. Most of the music you just enjoyed comes courtesy of guitarist John Sales. Thanks, as always, to Mr. Explores for my theme music and logo, and to the following legends for their vocal stylings. Taina Evans, Neil Hobson, Jim DiBartolo, Jordan, and Chris at Naturally RP. Naturally RP.